I'm David Cruz. I'm a landscape and travel photographer. I love taking photographs of natural landscapes and special places in lots of interesting corners of the world. Right now, I'd like for you to join me on a photographic adventure through England and Scotland. We'll see nature's beauty and lots of history and mystery all across the United Kingdom, from the highlands of Scotland to the White Cliffs on the English Channel. We'll travel to Stonehenge and Salisbury Cathedral and experience the high moorlands and tours of Dartmoor National Park. Then take the train north to the lovely Lake District in northwestern England, visiting Keswick and hiking above Derwentwater. We'll cross the border into Scotland for a peek at Edinburgh Castle and the striking and mysterious Roslyn Chapel. Then head north to Inverness and look for Nessie in Loch Ness. Our stay in the Highlands will take us to see the dramatic and beautiful Isle of Skye and a visit to the historic and impressive valley called Glencoe. It's back to London then to visit King Henry VIII at Hampton Court and see the delightful white cliffs at Beachy Head on the English Channel. We'll end our photographic adventure in London with a collage of famous sights, world treasures, and peaceful parks. We'll have some great video to enjoy, but since I'm a photographer, I'll also be featuring and sharing some of my finished photographs all along the way. That's what makes this program just a little bit different and why I call it my photographic adventure through England and Scotland. So come on, let's go. We'll save all the sights of London for later in our program. First, the train takes us west to Salisbury, where we will see the cathedral and then special dawn access to Stonehenge. England's trains are smooth and comfortable. We're leaving from London's Waterloo Station The beautiful River Avon winds its way through Salisbury and leads us to the 800-year-old Salisbury Cathedral with the tallest spire in England. You are looking at William Longes Bay, the third Earl of Salisbury. He was the half-brother of King John back in the early 1200s. He was loyal to the king and helped fight a disastrous battle to retake French territories. That debacle led to great changes to England and the world that followed, as Longes Bay helped negotiate between the king and a group of rebel barons, an agreement that would help keep things a little more fair and not put so many people in danger from a king's absolute authority. It was a peace treaty called the Great Charter, or Magna Carta. We're in the cloister at Salisbury Cathedral. It's the largest cloister in England, and just to our left is a building called the Charter House, where one of the original Magna Carta copies, the finest one of the four we have left, is kept. The original copies of the charters were distributed to various cathedrals, serving as neutral places, including the original Salisbury Cathedral called Old Sarum. Now the Magna Carta rests here in the chapter house. The charter is written in abbreviated Latin and laid out all in one long unbroken text. It's really quite astonishing that we still have this document. It resides here in Salisbury, but it lives in the fabric of our modern world, so influential as the ideological and legal basis for the freedoms of the individual, codified in the British parliamentary system, the American Constitution, and in many other expressions of modern democracy. Thank you. 
Salisbury Cathedral is a sacred place over 800 years old, but just eight miles to the north lies another sacred place, thousands of years old. With special access to walk within the stones at dawn, it's a real privilege to be able to photograph Stonehenge and just be here and walk among these ancient megaliths. The Great Stone Circle is the center of a massive complex of ceremonial structures and hundreds of burial mounds, first built with wooden posts. Then came the Great Sarsen Stones, marking the summer and winter solstices. It's now believed that the winter event was the focus of Stonehenge's builders. In the 12th century, a historian wrote, that no one can conceive how such great stones have been so raised aloft or why they were built there. That, of course, is the mystery of Stonehenge and what brings us to see and regard it with curiosity and a sense of the sublime. Let's head west from Salisbury and Stonehenge into Devonshire and the lovely little town of Ivy Bridge, which sits just on the southern edge of Dartmoor National Park. I came to Ivy Bridge because it's the only place at the borders of Dartmoor that is directly accessible by train. We'll go up on the moors in a minute, but first a lovely walk along the River Urn in the Long Timber Woods. From the lowlands to the north there in the distance, looking up toward Wales across the ocean passage, and then all the farmlands, and then all of a sudden, Dartmoor rises, some four to five hundred square miles of high moorland, covered in grasses and gorse. Lots of free-roaming sheep and Dartmoor horses, little ponies, roaming around. Well, were these jagged rocks once dogs that were turned to stone by an angry witch? That's one of the folklore legends surrounding Hound Tor. Arthur Conan Doyle was inspired by these rocks. He set one of his most famous Sherlock Holmes novels right here, The Hound of the Baskervilles. We're somewhere north of Bristol traveling across the English countryside. Just a taste there of our travels across the English Midlands. A little over six hours of very pleasant train ride takes us from Dartmoor all the way up to the Lake District and the town of Keswick. Derwentwater and the other lakes and hills of this area were home to famous poets like William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge. 
Also, Beatrix Potter wrote Peter Rabbit in this landscape. in Cumbria, in the north, uh, the northwestern part of England. Up in the mountains and with the beautiful lakes like Derwent Water that is just below me here, we're on the trail to the Catbells, and those are a couple of pretty peaks here to the west of the lake. Let's go! Lake is revealed. After a fun day of hiking up on the Catbells, we're in Keswick again. I'm sitting on the great lawn of Crow Park. Right in front of Derwent Water, the lake that reflects these mountains so beautifully. A short walk east of Keswick, another ancient surprise awaits our discovery. Castle Rig is another of the many stone circles in the British Isles. This one is larger in circumference and shorter in stone height than Stonehenge, but it dates from about a thousand years earlier. As with the other megalithic circles, we don't know the specific purpose and uses of this ring of stones, but the energetic mystery of it and the sense of the sacred are palpable when you walk into its presence. The ancient ones reach out to us with the very stones they touched and moved into place here so very long ago. Let's take the train over the border now to Scotland. The next train to arrive at Platform 1 will be the 1207 Transcanine Express service to Edinburgh. We're on the Royal Mile in Edinburgh, Scotland. This is Brodie's Close here on the Royal Mile. 
It's a tavern now, but this place was the setting for Robert Louis Stevenson's famous novel, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Standing proudly on the highest point of a great rocky outcrop, the Great Castle dominates the city of Edinburgh, as it has for centuries. In many ways, it's the emotional and patriotic heart of Scotland. We've entered through the Portcullis Gate now, and let's take a walk over the cobblestones. A few miles south of Edinburgh awaits an enigmatic and beautiful place of mysterious history. It has been the inspiration for much speculation that has led to stories, books, and motion pictures. We are at Roslyn Chapel, built by the Sinclair family. Way back, going to Templar times, this place is very special. A church since the 15th century. Some say that the Knights Templar may have brought their treasures from Jerusalem here for safekeeping in anticipation of the Templars' demise in 1307. Perhaps the treasures are still here today. Perhaps there is a connection to the Holy Grail. Mysteries are real. And so is Rosalind Chapel. Let's travel even further north to Inverness. Look for Nessie in Loch Ness and settle in the highlands in Invergary. Loch Ness is a beautiful deep lake or loch, but one always feels just a bit distracted while riding over its dark waves or driving along the narrow roads at its margins. Always looking over to the water to see if there is anything unusual there. No Nessie sightings on this quiet day, but I freely admit that I did look for her just a bit, in between other things, you know. The famous Urquhart Castle is perched on Loch Ness's northern shore, close to the little town that has, I think, the best Scottish name, the village of Drumna Drakit. This area is where most of the historic sightings of the monster have occurred, but today we will see mostly other tourists along the ramparts of the castle. For four days, my center for exploring the Scottish Highlands will be right here in the center at Invergary. This manor has been a hotel since 1958, the 
Glengarry Castle Hotel. We're right at the southwestern end of Loch Ness in the center of the Highlands in the Great Glen. The hotel is perched right on the shore of Loch Oich. Just a few hundred yards away is a real castle, but this one is in ruins. This is the Invergary Castle, the seat of Clan Donald, which was destroyed by the British after the failure of the Jacobite Revolution in 1746 at the Battle of Culloden. Bonnie Prince Charlie, though, himself came here right after the battle and sought refuge for a night before heading further into the Highlands. Beautiful area just northwest of Invergary. We're going to take this little trail through the forest. This is the River Gary. Water comes down from Loch Gary and crosses here into Loch Oich and then into Loch Ness. From Invergary, we'll travel over to the spectacular Isle of Skye, then head down south a bit to the historic and very impressive valley called Glencoe. An arm of the ocean provides the backdrop for the spectacular sea cliffs on Western Scotland's Isle of Skye. Kilt rocks resemble the Scottish kilt, and they form the backdrop for dramatic Mealt Falls, cascading directly into the ocean below. Three sea locks come together at the foot of dramatic Elandanan Castle. You've probably seen it in photos, television and movies. No special effects needed to be added on this day for this perfectly Scottish scene.
We're in the famous valley or glen called Glen Coe. It's a very beautiful and special place filled with memories of Scottish history. There was a famous massacre here in 1692 where about 30 of the MacDonald clan were killed by King William's men who were under direct order from the king to do so, even though they were under the MacDonald's hospitality and roof. Sir Walter Scott and T.S. Eliot, amongst others, wrote poems about Glencoe. In modern times, the massacre even inspired George R.R. R. Martin's infamous Red Wedding in the Game of Thrones. The Scots remember their lost clansmen, their spirits perhaps yet roaming the misty glen and tall bends of Glencoe. Let's leave Glencoe and Bonnie Scotland behind now and make our way back down to London, but not quite into the city yet. We're heading just west to Hampton Court and the palace of King Henry VIII. We'll take the short train ride over to Hampton Court Palace and see the King's Great Hall, as well as other Tudor parts of the palace, the Baroque side of William and Mary, and more, all along the River Thames. At Hampton Court, and we're coming into the Clock Court. We're standing just outside the Great Hall. The bricklayers and masons started on it in 1532. It was designed to be the great showplace of King Henry VIII. And you just never know who you will see around. The intricate woodworking of the hammer beam roof was designed by the king to reflect medieval structures he admired. The king designed his hall to impress, and it has, for hundreds of years. Seventy years after it was built, James I and his court came here to avoid a plague in London, and a certain William Shakespeare and his company performed A Midsummer Night's Dream in the Great Hall. The story of Abraham is depicted in the great tapestries in the hall, they were hung in 1546, made in Brussels from wool and silk and woven with gold and silver thread. The Great Hall served as a refectory for the royals and the staff, two meals per day at 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Those meals were served from the palace's giant kitchens, which were hellishly hot places to work. And they came, of course, with a hefty supply of the king's wine. The older Tudor sections of the palace were almost completely destroyed, but some of the later monarchs ran out of money, so they settled for tacking on their sections to the palace instead. If you came to see King William III at the turn of the 18th century, you would have entered through this grand staircase, then been filtered through smaller and smaller receiving rooms, and if you were important enough, or lucky enough, you'd get to see the king. This eastern front of the palace is from 1689, from the times of William and Mary. A day trip from London takes us down to the southern coast of England, to Eastbourne and the White Cliffs there. 
my first thought had been to visit the famous White Cliffs of Dover, but the cliffs here at Beachy Head are easier to see and are the most pristine of the White Cliffs in England. These are the Seven Sisters, and they lead up to the tallest cliff here, called Beachy Head. Here at Burling Gap, you can walk along the ocean's pebbled shore and get a close-up view of the White Cliffs, made of soft chalk and bits of flint. These cliffs can recede about two or three feet each year due to the constant erosion from the sea and wind on these soft cliff faces. These spectacular cliff faces and edges are dangerous but beautiful. Beachy Head itself is over 500 feet tall with its picturesque lighthouse perched right out in the waters of the English Channel. The South Downs Way takes us all along this edge. There in the distance, the Beltoot Lighthouse, now disappearing into the fog and the mist. We've caught our train and we've minded the gap, so let's conclude our photographic adventure with a collage of some of the sights of the great city of London. Busy Trafalgar Square in London. We've got Pikachu here and the National Gallery of Art. If you've ever traveled through the United States, especially New England, you know that there are a lot of church buildings that have a spire or a steeple right on the very front of the building, right over the entrance. That was not a very popular concept for architecture for a church at that time. It was quite controversial, but eventually it caught on and became especially popular in America, inspired by the idea of one architect for this arrangement of a church steeple. That was James Gibbs in 1726, when he built the St. Martin in the Fields Church right behind me. That's where we got that single steeple on the front of a church look, and this is the very first one. One place I never miss in London is the British Museum. Priceless world-class treasures surround you in this unique collection, and it's always such a treat to see. Westminster Hall is the oldest part of the Palace of Westminster, connected to the modern Houses of Parliament. It's the only part of the original buildings that survived a terrible fire in 1834 that destroyed the rest of the palace. The hall is almost 1,000 years old, with construction starting in the year 1097, and it has the largest clear-span medieval roof in England, in that wonderful hammer-beam carved wooden style. Next to it, and connecting it to the modern Houses of Parliament, is St. Stephen's Hall, which served as the original debating chamber of the Houses. The Tower of London is where you can see the crown jewels and a very wonderful display of armor from times past. That's in the White Tower.
350 acres of green space can be a wonderful place to relax or get some exercise. Hyde Park has been London's big park since it was a hunting grounds for King Henry VIII. It became a public park in 1637 and contains not only all the grassy grounds and trees, but two lakes, gardens, sculptures, and memorials. And on the western side, it merges into Kensington Gardens and Palace. We'll take a final moment here in Hyde Park to see the memorial fountain dedicated to Princess Diana. This lovely low oval stone fountain was completed in 2004. Well, thanks for traveling with me on this tour through England and Scotland. I'm David Cruz, and I'll see you again on another photographic travel adventure.